Hi everyone, my name is Moapema Sunday and welcome to Glebe Chapel Service Online. We appreciate your viewership and we thank God for all your support. Um, today's service, we have the kids slot that will be taken by Andrea and Ruth and we have a very special interview with Rosie. Our singing will be um, led by the music team, very talented musicians that are uh, based around Newent and further afield. Um, yeah, they do a very good job and um, we thank for God for those. And uh, we have our sermon entitled, Is Jesus Full of Love? Is Jesus Full of Love? Sounds like a very interesting topic. I'm looking forward to that. Uh, later on in the evening, we have our Joshua Project. So for everyone that signed up for Joshua Project, uh, there's one this evening. And if you lost your link, please um, email nccadmin at gleepchapel.org and uh, the link will be resent back to you. Right. For our call to worship, um, I'm going to read you from John 17 uh, verses 1 to 5. After saying all these things, Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son so that he could give you back the glory. For you have given him authority over everyone. He gives eternal life to each one you have given him. This is the way to have eternal life, to know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, the one you sent to earth. I brought you glory here on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. Now, Father, bring me into glory we shared before the world began. As we begin our, our service this morning, I just pray that we are ready to glorify God today. As Christ glorified him by completing the work that he was given, I pray that we can glorify the, our, our God through our singing and um, our dancing and just the message that we are going to have today. Just going to pray that uh, before we start. Our Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you that you are a God that starts something and completes it. Father, we thank you that your work was completed on the cross of Calvary and you were then glorified. Father, we just want to thank you that, Lord, you can use us while, while we're here on earth to glorify you more. As we start our service, we just pray for the Holy Spirit to be with us, to guide us, O oh Lord, through every activity. We just want to praise you and give you all the glory. Amen. Amen. And enjoy the rest of the service.
Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Now, before we start, I've got a message for Mia Smith. Mia, you have achieved your target 40. And if you'd like to go down to the Good News Centre with Mum and choose a book sometime soon, that would be great. But just a huge thank you, Mia, to you for taking part in lots of our kids' slot this last year. It's been really lovely to see you with Mum and we really appreciate all that you've done. So thank you very much indeed, Mia. Well done. What a star. Well done, Mia. Well done. Well, one of the most important verses from the Bible is John 3, 16, and it begins... For God so loved the world. I was thinking about that verse and wondering just how great God's love is and whether we could measure it. This morning, Ruth and I are going to show you several things that we use for measuring. We wondered if they might help to measure God's love. Okay, so we've got a set of measuring cups. Hopefully you can see those if I hold them a bit closer. We've got a metal tape measure and a Garmin watch. Those three things. Right, well, over lockdown, <laughs> I've done quite a bit of baking and have needed to measure the ingredients. If I were making some cakes, which one of the things that Ruth has just shown you would I use to make sure that I put exactly the right amount of flour, sugar and milk into my cake? <laughs> I expect you've guessed. That was quite an easy question, wasn't it? I expect you'd know that I could use a measuring cup. But I wonder if we might use a measuring cup to measure God's love. In Psalm 23 in the Bible, it says, the Lord is my shepherd. I have all I need. My cup overflows with blessing. Well, if our cup overflows with God's love, I guess we couldn't use it to measure God's love. Mm. Mm. Well, when I moved into this house, I needed to work out what I could fit in. So I needed to measure, you know, here the fridge, freezer and the piano and the cooker over there. I wonder if you can guess which one I used to measure the width and the height and the depth of these different items. Do you know? Well, you might realise that it was the tape measure, this very one in fact. Now, Psalm 108, verse 4, tells us that God's love is higher than the heavens. If God's love is higher than the heavens, I don't think we could use a tape measure to measure it, could we? <laughs> Certainly not. Certainly not. Well, obviously, the watch is used to measure time. So, what do you use your watch for then, Ruth? Well, I use this when I go out running because I like to know how far I've gone. So it measures time and distance. You can also use it when you're cycling. Very occasionally I do that. And if you do a workout, and I get a bit obsessed with the statistics, but basically it measures distance and time. Right. Well, there might be some people watching this morning who'll use their watches to measure how long the service lasts. <laughs> I wonder if we could use a watch to measure how long God's love will last. In Psalm 103 verse 17, we read that God's love remains forever. Wow. If God's love is everlasting, I guess we couldn't measure it with a watch, could we? So how can we measure God's love? Well, <laughs> the answer is we can't. But we do need to experience God's love in our lives. The Apostle Paul's prayer for the Ephesians was that they may understand how wide, how long, how high and how deep Christ's love really is. May we know that to be true in our lives as well. Now, a song that can help us to understand uh, this is God's love is like a circle. 
Mm. A circle, big and round. When you see a circle, no ending can be found. And it's just like the love of Jesus goes on eternally, forever and forever. I know that God loves me. Now, even if you don't know this song, I'm sure you'll recognise the tune. Let's have a go at singing it together. God's love is like a circle, a circle big and round. And when you see a circle, no ending can be found. And so the love of Jesus goes on eternally, forever and forever. I know that God loves me. That's great. So let's remember this morning that God's love is immeasurable and that it goes on forever and ever. Thanks for listening. Bye now. Bye bye. Hi everyone. So this morning I'm joined with Rosie. Rosie, give us a wave so you can hear us. Morning, everyone. Morning, yay, that's good. Um, so Rosie, just as a way of introduction, uh, you grew up in Glebe many, many years ago now, it feels like, because we went through Sunday clubs and youth group and together all the way through um, until you got married and you moved to, to Forest Community Church. Um, so I've invited you back to your home church. I like to think that we're at your home church. Oh, definitely. Um, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So for those who haven't seen you, how are you and what have you been up to? Cool. Yeah. So so um, thanks, thanks for having me on. So yeah, a, a lot of you, well, some of you might know me as, as Rosemary Hawkin. Uh, back in the day, uh, parents said Jill and Jonathan Hawkin. Um, so, so yes, I came to Blue Chapel when I was four um, and I left uh, in 2012 when I got married um, and I joined Forest Community Church, as you say. Um, so, yeah, we've had, we've had loads of fun. Um, so uh, when we joined the church, there weren't any other people our age, um, which is kind of why we joined that church, not staying at Glebe, because at Glebe there were loads of people our age, so that would have been lovely and comfortable, but it was good to, to move. Um, and now we've got a bunch of people our age at Forest Community Church as well, which is, which is really, really cool. Um, so, yeah, when I was with, uh, when I left Glebe, I was working in the equine industry. Um, and then I went to work in a coffee shop for a while. Uh, and now I work in an office um, and I love it. So, I, yeah, I, I thought I would hate office work, but I find it really rewarding. And, yeah, really enjoy, I don't know, managing staff and stuff like that. I find it really fun. Um, so, yeah, I'm... I don't know, we've led, led a home group for the last few years. Um, I've been the worship leader for the last couple of years. Um, so yeah, keeping really busy. Jo um, my, my husband, John, is on the senior leadership at Forest Community Church, so he's kept busy with all of that. Um, so yeah. Yeah, so not much yeah. then in the last few years. Well, no, no, <laughs> it's, it's been good. I'm a black belt kickboxer. I can snowboard, um, you know, and yeah. It's, <laughs> yeah we keep ourselves busy we like to have fun so yeah <laughs> that, uh, yeah no I think you've crammed a lot into those what nine years <laughs> eight, eight and a half eight, yeah, yeah eight yeah. years <laughs> yeah, I can't do maths can you tell <laughs> yeah. oh well Rosie thank you so much for for coming back um for one session only but thank you and um I invite you back because I know the last few years have been quite tough um and I wondered if you could just share a bit of your story with us. Yeah, 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so yeah, like, um, like I say, I got married when I was um, 21 and, uh, you know, had, had fun not having kids for a while. And then we thought, right, OK, yeah, let, you know, let's start a family. Um, and so we started uh, trying in uh, the spring of 2018. Um, never thought we'd have any problems because I'm young and healthy. And so, you know, so John. Um, uh, but yeah, nothing happened. Um, so I went to the doctors and went, yeah, I think there's something wrong here. And they said, right, well, you know, you've got to try for a year before we'll do anything because you're young and healthy, which is fine. Um, so waited a year and we're like, yeah, no, still, still nothing happening. Um, and then, yeah, started the whole process of blood tests and scans. And, um, you know, we got a referral to gynecologist. Um, and yeah, so that, that, uh, yeah. And, and so I, you know, I have infertility, um, which was massive shock. Never, ever saw that coming. Um, and just, oh my goodness, I was so impatient. Just like, oh man, like what, yeah, wh why? And why is this taking so long? And I have to say, you know, the care I received from the NHS was superb. Like they were spot on all the way through, but but it takes a long time. You know, it, it, it takes a, a long time to, uh, to, to get the referrals and to get the appointments and then to, to, to get the treatment. So um, I, yeah, I had keyhole surgery. Um, well, after I got my diagnosis of PCOS, which is polycystic ovarian syndrome, um, actually quite common. Um, didn't realize that until I had to start learning about it. Um, and uh, yeah, so um, gynecologist wanted to do keyhole surgery. So I had that in the spring of 2020. So we'd already been trying for two years when treatment started basically um so that had been really really tough waiting that long um and then I had my keyhole surgery that was all good I recovered well um and then COVID hit um and of course they couldn't give me any follow-on treatment because until they'd had it um like confirmed the the risk of having COVID in early pregnancy they wouldn't you know they wouldn't encourage pregnancy which was fine I understood um so then I was able to start Clomid treatment in June 2020 um and they would only give you that for six months. So I had a six month um, course of that. Um, and yeah, oh my goodness, the wait was horrible. It felt like the longest like time of my life. And I was just so impatient and I was so annoyed. And I really felt like my plan and my timeline of my life, um, you know, I'd got it all sorted in my head and I knew exactly what I was doing. And it was just so, so disappointing. Um, and yeah, I think infertility can become really, um, you get really obsessed about it um, because it's all about like, you know, dates and, and like what temperature I am in the morning. And like, it was just, uh, it was so all consuming. And it was always, you know, like obviously you'd see a pregnant person walking down the street or somebody else on Facebook got pregnant and like, oh, it was, yeah, so, so frustrating. And disappointing and just like why why do I have to wait this long um so yeah, as you were really... um yeah so as you were on this journey with with infertility I mean how did that affect your walk with God um you know waiting like like you said yeah and so I I, I know that God loves me I know that I'm a beloved child of his and I know that he wants the best for me so it was really good to kind of come from that angle, but to them just be like, but what, why, why, you know, was, yeah, definitely many, many nights crying into my pillow of why God, why won't you just give me the thing that I've asked for? Um, so yeah, definitely went through three of some plays. I, I think I never felt like God was saying no to me so uh, you know I didn't have to deal with that but it was just a, like a waiting um and yeah really really found that tough um and I think the things that that helped with that is um obviously I didn't I didn't tell many people because I didn't want to but I I had some um some friends which you know and, and family members which which we told and knowing that they were praying for us um during that time um was so like so um important for me it got this weight off my chest of when I didn't know what to pray for and I was just like look god you know what it is I'm just gonna cry into my pillow tonight um and you know and just knowing that there were other people who had the words for me who could pray for me um because there were just definitely times where I didn't have the words to pray myself so you've had all this treatment you've had all this waiting all this times of 
crying and and um, praying. What has it worked? How how are you now? <laughs> so uh, so yeah I'm, I'm currently I'm not sure when this is being aired but um, I'm currently 21 weeks pregnant um so so yes you, you may you may have seen that already but if you didn't then uh, then yes yeah I'm uh, yeah we're expecting our first baby so it's congratulations really exciting. thank you thank you it's really exciting and we're really grateful that so far the pregnancy has been completely healthy um because we were um got treatment through a fertility clinic you got an appointment at six weeks um and it's just incredible on an ultrasound there's like this tiny little blob you know but you can see the heart beating at six weeks like just unbelievable so incredible um so yeah we, we're feeling really really blessed um so yeah come september um our, our family is growing so so yeah it's really really exciting um and yeah we're feeling we're feeling very very blessed uh. Oh, Rosemary, thank you so much for sharing your story. I know um, infertility is not something that I think in society we don't talk about very much. Um, no, no, I think no, it's no. a really good thing to talk about in church and, and just to raise the issue in general. And um, I'm just conscious that there might be people who, um, who are in that same struggle or maybe got other struggles where they are waiting. They're praying mm. like you. They've been wrestling with something um, and maybe they're still in that boat. Um, what advice would you give to, to people who are still waiting like, like you were for so many years? Yeah, um, great question. <laughs> um, uh, so, yeah, I, I think uh, I never I never felt like I was being punished by God. I never, you know, I never felt like that. So don't don't get yourself into that kind of headspace. You know, like our, our father is a, is, a, is a loving, loving father who wants the best for you. Um, I, uh, holding on to the verse and um, Jeremiah 29 11 you know for, the, for you know the uh, for you know the plans I have for you said to the Lord um you know plans to prosper you to give you a hope and a future um hold, holding on to holding on to that verse was really important um and I think what I said before about having other people who can pray for you so that on the times when you just don't have the words um it it was it was such a relief for me to know that because there were there were nights where I was like I do you know what? I'm just so upset I can't I, I don't have the words I can't pray about this but knowing that there were other people praying on my behalf um and, and like I say not not I didn't tell many people um but just knowing that there were those people praying for for us you know for for us as a couple was um just yeah a, a real uh, it, it amazed me how much of a weight it you know it lifted off um so I think although it's it's horrible to tell people when like maybe you don't want to say what it is um so obviously only only people you trust but I found that really really helpful great thank you thank you for sharing and, and thank you for um being really open and really honest um is there anything that we can pray for you now Oof. um so yeah um thank you um so yeah healthy pregnancy uh wisdom um with this whole parenting luck um it yeah it doesn't strike me as a very easy thing to do um which is the yeah scary, scary move that um but yeah no I, I just think yeah yeah w w wisdom to know the the, the path to take them on um because this world is getting ever scarier and thinking that you're bringing a new innocent little helpless person into this world and and just wanting to be able to create an environment that's that's you know can help them thrive and you know and come to know um uh, the heavenly father you know like we do um yeah really value that thank you so much um, well let's pray now thank you. oh heavenly father we we come to you and we um we celebrate and we are just rejoicing and thankful for the way that you have worked in rosie's life the way um that you have been with her throughout this really, really difficult three, few years. And how, um, Father, we just thank you for this blessing, for this, this little baby. Um, Father, we pray for Rosie now that you will, um, yeah, that you'll be with her and with this pregnancy, Lord, that you will uh, keep her strong and healthy and the baby too. And Father, we mm -hmm. just um, bring them both uh, and Jonathan as well uh, to you mm -hmm. and just pray that, yeah, Lord, you would just really be, be with them at this time. 
Um, and Father, as we, as Rosie said about uh, the world that we're living in, and it can feel a bit scary. And Father, we just pray for, for Rosie and Jonathan as they become parents, that you will give them wisdom, you will give them strength, you will guide them um, and help them. Um, yeah, Father, and that you would just, um, yeah, just just be with them, Lord, to, to raise this child as you would have, as you would want them to. Um, Father, I'm just conscious as we've done this interview, this might have connected with many people who are in a similar boat, who are struggling, mm -hmm. who are praying and waiting and wrestling, not yet knowing the outcome um, of their prayers. And Father, I especially pray for those people this morning, Father, that you would be drawing close to them, that you would bring them comfort, that you would provide good friends that can pray for them too. Um, mm -hmm. And Father, yeah, we just pray that as your church, we will be uh, reaching out and be uh, showing love to, to people in these kind of situations who are still waiting. Uh, help us to, to be your hands and feet, we pray. Um, yeah, Lord, I just want to thank you again for Rosie, for the way that she's been so open and honest. Um, I pray that you will just really encourage her and bless her, we pray in your precious name. Amen. Amen. Thank you.
Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Glebe Chapel. My name is uh, David, or thank you for tuning in to Glebe Chapel. My name is David, and the community pastor here. Um, most of you probably know that by now. Most of you probably knew that before. But if you're tuning in for the first time, please uh, give the video a like and, and drop a comment or send an email just to say hello and that you're watching. Um, now I've just come back from Coffee and Kids, our parent toddler group uh, outreach activity, whatever you want to call it. Um, absolutely brilliant. Had. Um, about 40 parents there and, and loads of kids in separate rooms and at separate times and um, had all these procedures to keep everyone safe but absolutely brilliant. There was lots of uh, new parents there who become parents during uh, lockdown and, and haven't had the opportunity to do things like that before so thank you for your prayers, thank you for your help for those who helped. It was really really brilliant and I think we'll have an update next week uh, from Emma Louise about uh, what went on. I think Emma Louise and uh, um, Rosie and Sophia and Lydia have all <laughs> done an update, so we'll see how that goes. Um, but today I'm continuing our series, uh, Is Jesus? And today the question is, is Jesus full of love? Is Jesus full of love? And now we um, use the word love quite flippantly in the UK and in, in British culture. You know, we say I love fish and chips and we say I love my wife or my husband or I love my kids, I love my mum and dad. That's a very different type of love to the love that you would have for cake or the love that you might have um, uh, for football or for rugby or for whatever it is that you enjoy. In the same uh, day on Sundays, for example, let's rewind to Sundays two years ago, you'd come to church and you would sing and we would praise and we would worship God and we would sing songs sing, I, you know, that talked about our love for God and our love for Jesus and our love for the church. And then we would go home and have our roast dinner and say, well, I love these 
roast potatoes, but they're not really comparable, are they? Um, what Jesus has done for us in roast potatoes. We use the word love in all sorts of contexts, in all sorts of meanings. And in the British language, in our culture, we tend to only have one word that we use. Whereas in other cultures, in other languages, they have different words to describe different types of love, different expressions of love, different contexts of love. I love my wife in a different way to loving my parents and loving my children. And people, different cultures have different languages for this. Now in, in Spain and Spanish, they have three words to describe different types of love. In uh, American Sign Language, they have two words. In Tamil, which is the language in Sri Lanka, they have five. In Arabic, they have four. In Gaelic, they have four. Um, and, and in Japanese, they have two endings or beginnings to words. The Dexters, I'm sure, will put us right. Um, they, they have two beginnings or um, endings to different words that, that describe different types of love. Um, so there's lots of different words in Japanese. Almost every other language has several words to describe several different types of love. And ancient Greek, the, the, the language that the New Testament of the Bible was written in, was no different. It had four words for four different types of love. And just really quickly, there was eros, which is a, a type of, which describes romantic love. Uh, philos, uh, which describes a friendship, Stor storage. Uh, stor storge, excuse the pronunciation. Um, it's the affection that someone might have for, uh, you know, sort of wistful affection. You know, I would have affection for, I would have storge for, or storage for um, uh, haggis and bagpipes because I'm Scottish, right? That kind of wistful, emotive affection. There. And then there's um, agape, which is the divine love characterized by sacrifice and pursuit of another person's good. And that is the type of love that we are gonna talk about today. And it's the type of love that God, when the Bible talks about God's love for us and Jesus' love for us, he uses agape, divine love characterized by sacrifice in pursuit of another person's good. Now, Jonathan Edwards, who um, is a very uh, famous Christian writer, if you don't know who he is, then look him up, really inspirational. Uh, guy, we, we all have a lot to learn from him. He um, broke it down into, into two different uh, types of love, benevolent love uh, and complacent love. Now, this is these two are, are generally, you know, most Christian authors would um, would agree with that and say there's, you know, the Bible talks about this, you know, broadly speaking, two different types of love, um, complacent love and benevolent love. Now, complacent love is generally the type of love that we have for things or sometimes for each other. Um, it's a type of love that I had when I first met Emma Louise. I uh, loved her because she pleased me. That's the definition of it is, you know, something pleases you and so you love it. I loved Emma Louise because she, or I do love Emma Louise, not did, but I do love Emma Louise because she is pretty, because she is fun, because she used to proofread my essays when we were at university and that was um, a pretty painful job. Uh, I love her because of what she offered me. I love her because I am attracted to her. It's what I can gain from this relationship. And that's generally, when we say love between each other and different things, that's generally what we actually mean, is I am really pleased and really satisfied and really happy what the, about, uh, by what this person or thing has to offer me. And then there is benevolent love, a type of love that Jesus has for us, agape in reality. It's love based on the one who is doing the love, not the one being loved. It's not down to the actions or beliefs or attractiveness or capacity of the person being loved. It's all about the person doing the loving and their general attitude and their, their relationship with the item being loved with the person being loved it's unconditional love because the person doing the love is full of love now scripture says that jesus that god is love it says in 1 john 4 verse 16 and 17 it says god is love 
Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. In this way, love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment because in this world we are like him. And so we have benevolent love um, and complacent love. One is based on the person being loved and one is based on the person doing the loving. And so to come back to the original question, question, is Jesus full of love? That's quite an easy question for me to answer. We read all over scripture about God's love and about Jesus' love and God's love being personified in Christ, being represented and completed in Christ on the cross. Again, 1 John 3, 1. See what kind of love the Father has given to us in that we should be called God's children. And that is what we are because the world didn't recognise him. It doesn't recognise us. Psalm 86, the Psalms, Psalms are full of uh, of writings about God's love and God's wonder and his strength. And Psalm 86, 15 is just one of many verses that says, and it says this, but you, my God, are a God of compassion and mercy. You are very patient and full of faithful love. Ephesians 3, 18 and 19, it says, I ask that you'll have the power to, to grasp love's width and length and depth and height together with all believers. I'll ask that you'll know the love of Jesus that is beyond knowledge so that you will be filled entirely with the fullness of God. Scripture makes it very clear that Jesus loves us. Not only does it make it clear in what Jesus says and what others say about him, but in his actions in sacrificing his life on the cross for you and for me. I don't think there's anything I can say further that will convince you that Jesus loves you or not. You need to explore this yourself if you're not convinced. You need to read the scriptures, read the Bible and see what it says. Ask Jesus to reveal that love to you if you're not convinced. If you've been at church for years and years and you're unsure if Jesus really does love you, come back to the scriptures. Come and read them and pour over them and look for all of the points where Jesus says he loves you. And you'll find that it's a benevolent love. A love based on Jesus inherently loving you, not on what you do or how you do it. Now, of course, our behaviour and our actions and our attitudes uh, please God and they please Christ. And those who are in Christ, those who walk with Jesus, he loves in a different way than those who don't. But we won't get into that today. The most poignant thing that stuck out to me, that spoke to me when preparing this, when thinking about does Jesus love me, is not proving whether he does or not, but is asking the question, what should our response be to Jesus' love? There's a pastor in America, a lot of you will know the name, Francis Chan, um, a well-known speaker and pastor and author and um, in 2007, he was speaking at a conference to a room full of pastors, um, one of these pastoral conferences. Um, uh, and I was reading about it this week, and, and he, he creates this com moment of complete silence when he asks the question in one of his, I think it's the opening of one of his talks. He says, um, if I could take you to, to a place like heaven today, a place where there's no more pain, no more suffering, no more turmoil, all your friends and the family you've ever loved are there. Your favourite foods are available. Your favourite drinks are all there. You eat. You don't feel hungry, but you eat and you never feel full. Everything is perfect. The weather is perfect. There's no conflict. There's no difficulties. No, All of the failures and the guilt and the difficulty in your life is gone and everything is pleasurable and wonderful and designed to please you. If I said I could take you there today... But I told you that Jesus won't be there. Would you go? What a question. Of course, it isn't really something that happened that would happen. We know that Christ will be with us in heaven and that we are we will not be alone. In fact, being in his presence, in the presence of God and his glory will be enough. But the question he's asking is, do we love 
Jesus because we love him? Or do we love Jesus because of what he does for us? Do we have benevolent love for God? Do we have benevolent love for Jesus? A love that is based on us loving them because we are designed to love them. Loving God because he is God and we are his creation. Or we do, have, do we have a love that's based on what we can get from him, on what we can have, on what he offers us and what he offers me now and what he offers me in the future? Which love do we have? Do we love like Jesus loved us? Do we love like Jesus loved us? Or is it, a con is it a, the type of love that's based on what Jesus gives you and what he offers? I we actually see this in scripture, reading the Passion Week of Jesus the last week before Jesus' life. One day we have crowds following Jesus and he's doing miracles and he's doing wonderful things and speaking profound words to them. And they're praising him and worshipping him and, and thinking he's the best thing going. And the very next day, the same crowds are baying for his blood as he's offered up by Pilate. They worshipped what he offered, what he could give them. They didn't worship Jesus because he was Jesus. In John 15, 9 to 13, as the Father has loved me, this is Jesus speaking here, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. Some versions say walk in my love or live in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept the Father's commandments and abide in his love, these things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his love for his friends. As the Father loved me, so I have loved you. Walk in my love. And if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Now, what are Jesus' commandments? Love the Lord your God with all of your heart and your soul and your strength. And love your neighbour as yourself. Love the Lord your God. The word used for that love is akape. Um, love that is based on sacrifice for the good of another. And so what we can discern from that is that as Christ loved us, Christ sacrificed himself, gave of himself, came to earth to get to know people, to, to offer salvation. We are to do, the, repeat, the reflect, replicate the same type of love for God. A love that is based on who uh, God is, not on what he offers. A love that is based on the fact that we were his creation, designed with the purpose to love him. But then how do we get there? Like when I first met Emma Louise, I, uh, <clears throat> I had a complete love of complacency for her, what I could get from it, what pleased me. And I loved that and I loved her because of it. But as time went on, I realised that even if she couldn't offer me anything, even if all those things fell away, I would still love her because that is the way we're designed. We're designed to love one another. And so how do we get from that place of complacent love to benevolent love, a place where we love, love God because of what he offers us and what he can give us and what attract us, attracts us to him, to a place where we love him just because he is God and because we are designed to love him? And the answer is in the Holy Spirit. The answer is in keeping God's commandments. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Walk in the love of Jesus. The more we do something, the more I served Emma Louise, the more I gave back to her what she gave to me, the more our love grew. And the exact same is with God. The more we give to God, the more we serve him and worship him and get to know him and get to know Jesus as our friend, as our father, as our saviour, 
not just as something to study in the Bible, not just somebody to pray to with a list, but to really look at it and get to know him and want to know him and invite him into our lives. The more we love him because of who he is, the more we study who he is and what he has to offer and who we are, the more our love will change from what he offers to simply loving him because he is a wonderful, wonderful God. And what is the result of it? These things I've spoken to you, that my joy may be in you. Now notice the way that that goes round. A complacency, complacent love would be because I have your joy, I love you. But no, this is saying because you have my love, you will have joy. And if you follow my commandment and love God and love your neighbour, you too will have that joy. I don't know if you've, you've ever met somebody that's so in love with Jesus that no matter what happens, nothing shakes them. And that's at the point where we see this benevolent love of loving, because, loving for loving's sake, loving because we can't do anything but love Jesus. It's at that point that we see what our love is really made of. A family friend of ours, a, a lady whose, whose life was headed in a brilliant direction. She had a loving husband, two wonderful children, one going to study medicine, um, one a, in a successful job. Um, she is a Bible college graduate, plugged into a local church. Everything was going brilliantly. She loved Jesus. Fast forward 30 years and it's like a story of Job in the Old Testament. Her husband couldn't stand to be in the same room as her. His personality had completely changed. He scoffed at her prayers and laughed when she talked about Jesus. Her son had become an alcoholic. Her daughter had been put into a coma for 20 years by her daughter's boyfriend through abuse. Her life had fallen apart. The peace, the gentleness, the meekness, the, the favour that, that, that Jesus offered her seemed to have disappeared. Now, of course, when we read scripture, we recognise that the, the, yeah, the joy of salvation had disappeared. But yet she was still joyful. She still loved Jesus. She still knew that he was her saviour. And despite everything going on around her, she loved him. Her love for Jesus held her in a place of joy. She's in glory now. She passed away several years ago. But if you asked her before she died, why are you so joyful, deeply joyful in the midst of all of this pain and suffering? She would have quoted John 15, 9 to 13. As the Father has loved me, so I have I loved you. Abide in my love. She would have said, I walk in Jesus' love every day, reminding myself that he does love me and asking for the Holy Spirit to give me that same love, love that is not based on what I can get or who I can be or, or what pleases me, but a love that is based on what pleases the Lord and the love that, that God had designed for us to have for him and for humanity before the fall. Galatians 5.22 when I mean, it's talking about the fruits of the Spirit, it says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love. We often think that if we love enough and we show enough love, the fruits of the Spirit will then come out of us or come upon us. But the scripture is saying, no, love is a fruit of the Spirit. What type of love? Acape. Sacrificial love that is not based on what you can get, but based on you being loving for loving's sake. The sustenance of that love, the sustenance of our love for Jesus comes from a love of benevolence. That is why we should get to know Jesus. That is why we should be walking with and in Jesus' love. It's not about doing everything or working harder than everyone else or understanding more than anyone else 
Lots of us work hard and understand scripture and do all of these good, good things. But we need to know Jesus and we need to ask him to, com- to reveal to our heart every day how much he loves us and to reveal to us how we should love him and love others. So what might that application actually look like for us as a church today? We are called to love the least. We are called to love our neighbour, despite who our neighbour is. We are called to benevolent love for God and for those around us. If we are aiming to love Jesus because of the change in our hearts that the Holy Spirit is making, that takes the focus off of me and what I can gain, what I can gain from church, what I can gain from you as brothers and sisters in Christ, what I can gain from worship, what I can gain from things. If we offer up benevolent love, love that loves for love's sake, love that loves because the Holy Spirit has changed us to simply love others and love God, it completely changes the way we do things. Church no longer becomes about me. Relationships no longer become about me. They become about God the Father and become about you. And that is the community that we are called to be. Being church at the heart of the community. Being a church that is full of love for one another and full of love for God that isn't based on what I can get at all. It's based on what you can get and on what God can get and what we can offer. Loving for loving's sake. It throws a spanner in the works. And that's why the community centre is so important. We can love the community with the community centre. We can love the community with our relationships built in the community centre. As I said, I've just come from Coffee and Kids. I don't think any of the helpers there were there for their sake. I don't think any of the helpers there were there loving parents who've had a terrible year (laughs) for their own good or their own sake. They were doing it because they have been called to love because the Holy Spirit has changed their hearts to love others more than themselves. Love your neighbour and love the least as if they are Jesus. Let's be a church that loves the least in everything we do, loves Jesus above all and becomes uh, because he loves us and will not stop loving you. Today we could have talked about how uh, Jesus loves believers, how Jesus loves sinners, We could have talked about why we should love him and the sacrifice that he made. But today I just wanted to challenge us of how do we respond to the love that Jesus gives us, the sacrificial, unconditional love. Do we take it and store it up for ourselves and take what we can? Or do we focus on reflecting that love back to God and on others around us? Let me just pray Uh, and then we'll finish. Father God, we thank you for who you are, and we pray that you would help us to love like you did, help us to love sacrificially for the benefit of others. Lord, it's a hard calling, but we can see in your word that if we walk in your love and we follow your commandments to love the Lord our God and to love our neighbour, that you will bring us joy. Help us to walk in that love, not just so that we can have joy, but help us to walk in that love because we are designed to love because you have made us to love. Give us the love of the Holy Spirit in our hearts so that we can display who we really are, children of God. Father, we thank you for who you are and we thank you for your love for us. In Jesus' name, amen. But he brought me in all oh, his love for me All oh, his love for me Who the song sets free Who oh, is free indeed I'm a child of God Yes I Freedom has ransomed me.
Yeah. 